Welcome, nobody and everybody, to a very lonely start to the second semester of this 2020-2021 school year here in AP Biology. Today we're going to start with Unit 5 and some lecture notes over the very beginning of Chapter 13. This unit will be uh, composed of chapters 13, 14, and 15, and your ch uh, unit five test will be the last school day of this month, of January 2021. A few reminders before we get started. At the end of last semester, your homework for the last few classes was to take notes on chapter 19 on viruses. Those notes are due this Friday by the end of the day, and it will be your first grade of the semester, and it will all count like your other notebook checks have counted. So you can send me pictures of those depending on your location and situation, or on Friday, you can bring them by at office hours or whenever you have time. Or you can show them to me in class on Thursday, if that works better for you. You will also have reading for tonight into next class. I could give a quiz over any reading assignment for this entire semester, so keep that in mind. The reading that you have for next class is the information that we're going to cover today. So my goal this year is to, or at least for this semester, is to be able to lecture to you and discuss this material and then have you read about it after we have discussed it in class. So, Unit 5. Unit 5 is a unit about sex, meiosis as opposed to mitosis, and genetics. Those three major ideas or topics. And what we have here on the screen behind me is the moment known as fertilization in which a sperm cell fertilizes an egg cell. And this is, in all likelihood, some sort of animal. I don't know if it's actually human, but that is the moment at which we have a diploid cell a somatic cell, and I will discuss what those terms mean. Now, if you have two sex cells, or gametes, which is what sperm and egg cells are known as, when you have two gametes that fuse together, join together, the sperm cell entering the egg cell, when that happens, you have what is known as sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction is a form of reproduction that involves the fusion of two gametes. The alternative is what we would call asexual reproduction, in which an organism typically will just divide through, say, the process of binary fission in prokaryotes, which we talked about a little bit last semester. Or if you have asexual reproduction in eukaryotes, then that will happen through mitosis and cytokinesis, which is also a topic that we spent some time on at the end of last semester. So those are the two ways in which reproduction can happen. It's either asexual, which does not include gametes, or it is sexual reproduction, which involves the fusion of two gametes, or sex cells, or typically we would just say sperm and egg cells. Now, why sex? 
Why would you have sexual reproduction? Sexual reproduction is actually fairly new on the evolutionary scene. There was a time where life only reproduced asexually. And when you have asexual reproduction and you have one organism that's basically dividing into two copies of itself, you tend to have what are clones of the original. So essentially with asexual reproduction, you have one individual making two copies of itself. Now those copies aren't always perfect. They might be a little bit different from the parent or the original organism, but there is a lot of similarity between the original and the daughter cells in asexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction has caught on around the world over the last billion years or so because it provides one very important thing for a population as a whole, and that is variation or diversity. When you involve two separate individuals, each carrying their own set of chromosomes with their own unique genes, and you combine random chromosomes and genes from each of the parents in the form of chromosomes carried by a sperm cell and chromosomes carried by an egg cell, you are going to essentially shuffle the deck. You're shuffling a deck of genetic cards and the offspring you produce through sexual reproduction are going to be much more diverse and see much more variation than the offspring produced during asexual reproduction. Diversity and variation is good. It helps a population. In unit seven, we are going to talk about evolution and what makes a species successful or go extinct. And one thing we will keep talking about is diversity. And we will come back to this idea of sexual reproduction later when we get to that point in March and April. And I will talk again about the importance of diversity. So moving on. And as a reminder, all of these diagrams are from your book from your reading that you have for tonight, you have access to them, and these specific slides are going to be on the coursework page. So if you haven't done so already, and you're just watching this video, maybe pause it at this point and pull up these slides so you can look at them while you hear me talk about them. It might be easier for you to see them as opposed to how you can see them in this video. So here we have a diagram of sexual reproduction, and there are a few terms that I've already mentioned and a few terms I haven't mentioned that I will talk to you about. So in the animal kingdom, okay, so plants and fungi actually kind of do their own weird thing, and we'll talk about that at the very end. But in the animal kingdom, you're going to have male and female parents, a male and a female parent. Now, let's start with the beginning of the lifetime of these parents. So we'll go back from to the beginning of the male and female's life. And we have what is called a zygote. A zygote is simply a fertilized egg. It is a cell that is essentially an egg cell with a sperm cell having entered it and fused with it. That is a moment, by the way, known as fertilization, which is where we'll end this circle of life uh, when I'm done talking about this diagram. But a zygote is the single cell that all of you and me and everyone else once was, okay? You once were a single cell 
called a zygote, one single cell. It looked just like the cheek cells that we looked at in the microscopes back last semester. One of those cheek cells would look very much like the single cell you once were. How did you get from that single cell to a human, maybe not yet full grown, but eventually a full grown male or female? Well, the answer is through mitosis. Mitosis, which we talked about last semester, is simply taking a cell and making two copies of that cell once they divide during cytokinesis. Now, you see this little notation here. It says 2n equals 46. It's kind of a strange bit of notation. That 46, as you probably recall, is how many chromosomes you have in the original cell, the zygote that you once were. And thanks to mitosis, you are now billions and billions and billions of cells. Each one has a nucleus, and inside every one of those nuclei are 46 chromosomes. That is a number of chromosomes you have because you are a human. Now, the 2N here is a symbolic way of us representing a term that we call diploid. Most of your cells, almost all of your cells are diploid cells. Your zygote is a diploid cell. Diploid, if you think about kind of the prefix of die there, means two sets of chromosomes. So you actually have two sets of chromosomes. One set of 23 came from your mother. One set of 23 came from your father. 23 plus 23 is 46. And so you now are a multicellular diploid young adult that has 46 chromosomes in every cell. That is possible through mitosis. That is how we grow and develop from the single zygote to the adult form. Now, throughout your life, you will need to make more skin and repair organs and all sorts of other needs for cells arise, and you will make most of those cells through mitosis you know, during prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, with cytokinesis occurring in telophase and the splitting of the cells uh, occurring. And that's how you get more cells that are like the cells you start with. But in animals, adults, well, not just adults, but in animals, you have organs or structures known as gonads. These are gender or sex-specific structures. In males, the gonads are called the testes, and in females, the gonads are called the ovaries. Now, it is inside these structures that you have a process called meiosis, or sometimes people say meiosis, but I say meiosis. Meiosis is a process similar to mitosis, and that process is going to take diploid cells with 46 chromosomes, and it's going to turn special cells in your gonads into either sperm cells, if this process of meiosis is occurring in the testes of a male, or egg cells, if the process of meiosis is occurring in the ovaries of a female. So it's meiosis 
occurring only in certain cells of the gonads, cells known as germ cells, G-E-R-M, the germ cells of the testes and the germ cells of the ovaries will at some point, at a very young age in uh, females and throughout the adult lives of males, the process of meiosis will make these gametes. The sperm cells and the egg cells, those are the gametes. Now, this process is something we will talk about in depth next class. So you don't have to worry about the details right now. And let me tell you, there's a lot of details. So get ready. But in this process of meiosis, you take diploid cells and you make what are called haploid cells. And those are the gametes. Now, for me, when I think of haploid, I think of half. Haploid, half. They have half the normal number of chromosomes that you would find in most of your cells. But technically, it is one set of chromosomes. You create either sperm cells with a single set of 23 or egg cells with a single set of 23 chromosomes, depending on your sex. The sperm and egg cells in animals are going to fuse during fertilization, and that is where a diploid zygote comes from. 23 chromosomes in the sperm cell, 23 chromosomes in the egg cell. They combine to make a zygote with 46 chromosomes. That would result in a pregnancy. And if that pregnancy were to proceed successfully, that single-celled zygote, which has 46 chromosomes, through mitosis would eventually become an adult with gonads that could make their own gametes, that could fuse during sexual reproduction, specifically fertilization, and that's how we continue our generations of people or of any animal. Now, this next slide is just a sneak peek at the process of meiosis in any living organism that undergoes meiosis. And essentially, we have the parent cells, the father and the mother cells. And what you can see, and again, we're going to go through a lot of these details next class. So as an overarching view, what we have done here in these diagrams is simplified the chromosome number from 46 down to two. So we're pretending that this is an organism that just has two chromosomes as its diploid number, as opposed to the human diploid number of 46. So this is simplified because it would be a nightmare to draw all 46 chromosomes inside each one of these diagrams. So what you find, and we're going to compare this to mitosis, is that you have a diploid cell which makes a copy of the chromosomes within that cell, which happens during the S phase of interphase, which we've already talked about. That's nothing new. That cell will divide into two cells. That's just like mitosis except the division here is a little different than in mitosis. We'll talk about how it's different next class. And essentially, we now have two cells with half the number. We've already gone from diploid, two chromosomes, or two sets of chromosomes, to haploid cells. But, and I wonder if you remember this term, these single chromosomes here still have a copy of themselves attached 
and they are still in that sister chromatid state. And where meiosis gets much different from mitosis is that there's actually a second round. We divide into meiosis one and meiosis two. A second round of division in which the sister chromatids will actually separate. And now we have four cells from the original cell that is in your gonads. And these four cells can become gametes. Now your book doesn't really go into this, but I think it's a little bit fascinating and to mention this. In males, you make four functioning, hopefully functioning, sperm cells. In females, only one of the four actually becomes an egg. This diagram's a little misleading. It indicates that there's four eggs. Every time meiosis occurs in a female, you get one big egg cell that you get through a kind of an uneven division of cells. And then you get three tiny little cells that we call polar bodies that are just reabsorbed by the ovaries. I, I really don't know what happens to them, but they're broken down and recycled. So males tend to make a lot of sperm cells and females tend to make a small number of very big egg cells. Now, this might be a little bit oversimplified, but again, we'll get into the details later. Keep in mind that in a diploid cell in humans, you have 46 chromosomes, okay? And that this diagram is only showing two chromosomes in the diploid cell. We have looked at these pictures before. This is called a karyotype. Your reading will discuss karyotypes, but essentially it's just a picture of all 46 chromosomes from a diploid cell of a human that has a normal number of chromosomes. And you can see here, they are arranged in pairs. We actually number the pairs so we have a number from 1 to 22. That's 22 pairs of chromosomes for 44. And then the last two to make 46, we label them with the letters X and or Y. The 22 that are numbered here are called autosomes. They are kind of just regular chromosomes which remember are made up of a ton of DNA. And when we start talking about genetics and genes, the genes that you talk about in the field of genetics are sections of DNA somewhere on these chromosomes. The last two that are labeled with either X's or Y's are what we call the sex chromosomes. And in this picture, we have an X paired with a Y. That's the karyotype or picture for a human male. In human females, it is two X's paired together. Notice I'm using the term pair. Because if this were your karyotype, one of these chromosomes comes from your mother, one of these comes from your father, and they're a matching pair that hold the genes for the same traits in the same locations. So if on chromosome number one, you have a little gene at some point on this chromosome that says, you know, what color your eyes will be, that eye color gene is also located on the other matching chromosome that your father gave or your other parent gave. 
So you have two genes for every trait. One gene came from your mother, one gene came from your father. They don't have to be the exact same type of gene, but they are the same gene for the same trait. Eye color, skin color, you know, whether you're lactose intolerant or you make some digestive enzyme. Whatever it is, you have matching pairs of chromosomes. And we call matching pairs homologous pairs. Homologous pairs. One from the mother, one from the father. And this is why we use the term diploid, two sets. You have a mother and father chromosome for each of the different types of chromosomes you have for a total of 46. Okay, we will come back to karyotypes. I actually have a kind of a fun activity where you kind of make a baby and look at its karyotype and see what your baby's gender will be and if there are any chromosomal abnormalities uh, in your baby. And we'll revisit this idea. The last slide is a little bit unusual. It's how this reading section for tonight ends. And it's a comparison of animals, plants, and fungi. And here at the beginning, we have basically what I've been talking about, what that previous slide with parents, fertilization, zygote, cycling around. You have an adult animal. It will make gametes, sperm and egg cells. Through fertilization, they fuse. They create a zygote. Through mitosis, that zygote grows into an adult. And the process continues as those adults produce more sex cells through meiosis. Again, meiosis is the production of sex cells, at least in animals. It's technically the taking of a diploid cell and the making of haploid cells. Meiosis cuts the number of chromosomes in half in the cells that are produced. And that way when two halves come together, you're back around to a whole zygote, which has the number of chromosomes needed to make a normal adult. That is what you see in sexual reproduction in animals. Now, just to address this topic, I'm not going to go into much detail here, and your book doesn't go into a whole lot of detail either, but in plants, it's a little bit weirder than that. Plants have sex. There are male plants and female plants. And many plants actually have both the male and female structures within the same sex structure, which in a lot of plants is just the flower. The flower is going to contain the gonads or sex structures of a plant. Now, look and see how a plant is a little bit different. In plants, you have sperm and egg cells that fuse together in fertilization. This is going to happen a lot in this area in the spring and summer. Uh, pollen is essentially kind of the male sperm producing structure. Uh, and the female producing, or the female structures in flowering plants at least, plants that make flowers, are going to be uh, in the flower itself. So plants essentially need to get their pollen from male flowers to female flowers. And that's plant sex. Now plants can't move. So they have to find a way to get their pollen to female flowers. And some plants like pine trees and corn just use the wind. They just release a ton of pollen and let the wind randomly blow that pollen to the female flowers of um, the female plants. When that happens, you have fertilization. 
The zygote, which is going to be located within the seed, is going to eventually grow into a diploid adult. But this is where it gets a little bit weird. Now, just like animals, the diploid adult in the male and female gonads of the plant will make haploid structures. They will make haploid cells. But those haploid cells aren't directly the sperm and egg cells like they are in animals. Instead, the haploid cells that adult plants make grow into their own haploid adult. And that is what we call the gametophyte in plants. And in, say, a lot of plants that produce flowers, the pollen is actually the male child of that plant. And the female child is just a haploid organism that is within the female flower. So it's actually a new generation of offspring, but they are haploid. And then they will make, through mitosis, more haploid cells. Those are the sperm and egg cells. And those fuse to make the next generation of zygotes that grow into the next generation of adults. That may not make a whole lot of sense. But the animal analogy would be if in humans you raised your sperm cells like your male offspring, like your sons, and you raised your eggs and they grew into your daughters, and then they later sexually reproduced, and then your grandchildren looked like you, but there was this generation in between that was haploid and didn't look like you. Imagine that in the human world. That is so bizarre, and it's how plants live their lives. It's called alternation of generations, where plants have a diploid generation, the kids are haploid, their kids are back to diploid, but their kids are haploid, but their kids are back to diploid. So it's diploid, haploid, diploid, haploid. Very weird. I'm not even gonna try to explain fungi. It's a lot like the plant world, well, I, I, I don't really honestly know enough about fungus sex to go into the details, but essentially their diploid zygote never grows into a multicellular form. It just divides into haploid spores that then live their life and eventually will produce gametes through mitosis, oddly enough, and make more diploid generations. The fungus thing, just forget about it. I will never ask you about it. The plant thing, look over it. I could see asking one or two very general questions about it. Now, that is your overview, your lecture for 13.1 and 13.2. Read those sections for homework and take notes on them because we're starting our notes that I will check on test day at the end of January. That's your homework. I have a practice sheet on the coursework page, so please go to your coursework page and check that out. It's not going to be graded. Just once you're done with your reading, taking notes, take a look at it. Um, right now would be a good time as well to take a look at it, but you could also do your reading. As long as your reading is done and you look at your practice uh, on the coursework page, then you will be ready for next class. And I will see you then. Goodbye.